right. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about museums and podcasting examining cultural power. The purpose of this is to take a look at museums as a medium and kind of compare it to a medium that we all are more familiar with, which is that of podcasting. So yeah, what does the medium of podcasts look like? And what does the medium of museums look like? And sort of what can one teach us about the other? I'm Ian Elsner. I'm the host of Museum Archipelago. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But first, I want to start our journey with a statue. And this is a statue that appeared in 2011 on my daily commute to the University of Florida. And this is attached a statue of a football player named Tim Tebow. And as soon as it was built, it just basically appeared one night. I was surprised because it was commemorating recent events. In fact, I, I was used to seeing this fellow in the flesh in the dining hall. And then all of a sudden, here he was as a statue. And it wasn't just the statue. It was the entrance to, the statue itself was the entrance to a trophy room. Instead of just presenting these trophies, it started presenting a story. There were reader rails now. There, were, uh, there was information, there was, there was maps, there was information about, say, a pigskin football from the 1930s that they played with once. It was a, you know, a, a, a jersey covered in, covered in mud and, and grass that, that they played with. And so in, the, in, in just a few short years, this trophy room sort of became something more. It became a museum-like space. And it wasn't just the University of Florida. Sort of all across the conference, this started happening to, muse to trophy rooms, to Hall of Honors. Everyone has a different way of describing them. But they became more museum-like spaces. Just two and a half hours away at the Florida State University, it, it also incorporated artifacts from the Seminole Nation, which is today in present-day Florida and present-day Oklahoma. And it was very subtle the way they did this, but it was sort of a blink if you missed it. The idea was that individuals from the Seminole Nation fighting against the U.S. government in the, night, in the 1800s were part of this long tradition of athletic excellence, which ended in those trophies. And so you can see how it's using the trappings of museum presentation to tell this particular story. So the question is, why do these athletic programs adopt museums-like spaces? And the answer is pretty simple. Museums are seen as trusted spaces. They're seen as trustworthy institutions. It's actually amazing to the extent that they are. Um, some surveys, in some surveys, it's second to only to friends and family for newsworthiness. So in other words, if your friends and family tell you something happened, you trust it. If, uh, if a museum tells you something happened, you trust it almost as much. And this is particularly interesting in the backdrop of sort of a general lack of trust in, in other types of institutions, in newspapers, in, in, all sorts of, in all sorts of other media we see this. But it's worth asking ourselves why. And this is, this is where it all, this is sort of the heart of what I'm about to talk about today, is that what if the reasons why these museums are seen as so trustworthy is because they've always been very good at upholding the status quo, the party line. They put, what if all of the things that they've presented has been one in the same? Because of course the truth is that museums have a centuries long history of supporting white supremacist, racist, colonialist ideologies, not just sort of presenting them, but also undergirding them, using them as the, using the power of the museum medium itself. And this goes all the way back to the British Museum, in, which was the first sort of public museum. The people who founded it sort of saw it as this, this great way to let the masses experience these objects. But of course, it was just an exercise in colonial power, which is a story for another time. <laughs> the question that I want to sort of examine with you is, so what is it about the medium of podcasting? Like, is it something inherent? Sorry, did I say podcasting? Yes. I got museums. <laughs> what is it about the medium of museums? Is it, is it something to do with sort of the columns outside or the presentation mm -hmm. methods? Or is it simply the exercise of saying history and putting a period on it, the problem? And it's complicated to talk about, so I'm going to enlist some other people to help. This is Alanda Spears, and she co-founded the Agamont Educational Initiative 
and it's a New England organization that supports New England educators and museums, and basically the consulting work provides a path forward for doing competent museum exhibits and, and uh, sort of competent educational programs about Native culture and Native contemporary issues. And she says that one of the easiest ways that she can tell whether a museum institution is properly acknowledging its colonialist past is by the presentation of it. What, what is it doing with the physical heritage? And if it's, if it's not presenting in a certain way, then that's a tell for her. So she starts, or she talks specifically about a Haudenosaunee cradle board, and she saw one presented in the Detroit Art Earth Institute. She compared it, of course, with the cradle boards that held her as a child and securely held all four of her children. What, what, and, and she says, she says this, so each of the, the process of these, of these cradle boards is sort of ceremonious, ceremoniously tie, tying and retying them for every child. But in the, in the Detroit Art Institute, it's not presented this way. It's sort of presented as this sort of cold, lifeless artifacts. And she says, when you look at the cradle boards within museum collections, that stripping of those experiences and the spiritual and emotional life of that piece is a violent one. And it's a very apt representation of what colonialism is. It's a reminder that our understanding of our own material culture is not the one that's important. So in other words, the presentation that's designed to build trust is very specifically about our relationship to the object as a visitor and not the relationship to the object as someone who has a, a different relationship with an object. And it's just, again, it's something that museums do in, in whether they're history museums, um, science museums, even art museums, but that's just what a museum is. And this is why it's so difficult to talk about. So critically, while museums are sort of the, this gatekeeper that I'm describing, the word museum is actually gatekeeperless. Anyone can use the word museum. And this is one of the things that's sort of so powerful and we take advantage of this in Museum Archipelago when we talk to various things that call themselves museums. This is a quote from Julia Garcia. And she did, a, uh, she did an excellent thesis on, on sort of the rise of creation museums that's called Faith Display the Science, the Role of Creation Museums in the Modern American Creationist. And she describes sort of the 1990s when creationism had kind of hit a, hit a cul-de-sac in its reach and it saw sort of this deliberate strategy of adopting sort of the prestige of museums to get their word out. And she says, museums have a really long history in the U.S. as places of scientific research and public education. So we just described. So simply by attaching that word museum, it gives the building a sheen of credibility that it otherwise wouldn't have if it was called a theme park, a Bible center, or something. And to be, to be fair, they have tried theme parks and, and Bible centers. And uh, if you listen to uh, some of my episodes, we, we go into that. Just adding that word museum makes us think less critically. Alana Spears talks about this a little bit later on. So she understands better than most what it means to have an object that isn't, that's displayed in a way that's different from her own experience with it. So I asked her, well, when you go to the museums that that, that are of nations or groups of people that you don't know very well, what, are you still caught up in the museum? Are you still caught up? Do you still believe it? And she said, Absol absolutely. Like there's something about the act of going into a museum, of knowing that it's a museum, that sort of humble seeking of knowledge that even someone who, who can talk about this very articulately is still sort of caught up, caught up. And this is what David Gaw, a, a, a chairperson of the Six Rivers Aboriginal Corporation in Devonport, Tasmania, learned when he visited the Tiagara Cultural Center and Museum as a child. So this center was built in 1976, and um, it was built without any consultation of Tasmanian Aboriginals. Instead, it was built by citizens and scientists who didn't have any consultation with anyone that they were presenting and also assumed that they were all dead. So he remembers visiting the space <laughs> as a child and seeing sort of the information about him and his family that he knew not to be true. In other words, that they were extinct. Now he is the manager of this museum. 
and he just got the keys a couple of years ago. He says here, as soon as I got the keys to the door, I put masking tape over the words, the sticky tape there. I put masking tape over really inappropriate words. I've written over them like beautiful people rather than some of the words that were under those. And so now we can put ourselves in here rather than we don't exist. And so this is an example of the museum world becoming more fragmented, at least. In other words, there are opportunities to take that authority that the museum provides and sort of literally put masking tape over it. And so this is kind of an interesting, an interesting thing to, th thing to think about. If we, if we sort of accept that the authority is, is ill-begotten, it's still, it's still a level of authority. And I think that that currency and the ability to use that currency kind of dwindles as the years go on. And this is actually where I see podcasts comes in because the trust reserves that museum have built up over the centuries aren't going to last forever. Better to focus on earning that trust somehow. And if we look at the, the nature of podcasting, that's what we find. You know, no one says podcasts are trustworthy. That would be ridiculous. You know, we, we say this podcast is trustworthy if we happen to trust it. Every podcast has to earn our trust. And so it's just a completely different model from how we think of museums. And it's kind of interesting because we're at this point now where oh, there's an order of magnitude difference, but those, those first two numbers line up about the number of museums. I mean, if we just look at the number of museums, it's, it's more than every Starbucks and every McDonald's on the planet. So there's a lot of museums, there's a lot of, there's a lot of museums that use this word, museum. And there's a lot of opportunities to say, take that authority from any particular museum and sort of have a localized, a, I would call a localized win. So back when I was passing that Tivo statue every morning, this is what I uh, looked like and what I was working on. I was working on sort of new interfaces for the Florida Museum of Natural History on campus. And so I did these connect-based pieces that talked about how birds flo flew, or um, this was an evolutionary puddle-based game where you would sort of track different creatures in, in different parts of the pond and watch sort of a sped up version of evolution if you were able to isolate them from various populations. It was, it was super fun. And um, I was not, let's say I was not really thinking critically about museums at this time. Um, and then it just got worse. I started going to museum installs all over North America after I got a job with a, with a museum firm in Boston. And I started talking to a lot of museum directors. And so here I was, someone who's never been uncomfortable in a museum, now having all of this access. So I, was, I, was, uh, I would pretend to be a vis visitor and casually watch people using interactive software that we had developed and sort of like, oh, that's interesting, the way you... The way you do that, I became with every little detail of the operations. I can now walk into a museum and know where the, where the AV closets are and where all of that happens and where the computer systems are. I'm sort of, just to make sure everyone is, the, we talk about trust. I, I try not to know as much as I can about the security systems so that they will never be a, be a, I'll never be a suspect. <laughs> And this is where I had, the, I had the idea for Museum Archipelago. Today, at the best of times, I would describe it as a tiny show that helps you think more critically about museums. But that was not how it started. I started basically by thinking of this landscape as museum, uh, of museums. And, and again, that was kind of the, the tiny innovation of the show, was to say, okay, there's this no museum is an island, and these these somehow it's all connected. The, uh, the, you know, every museum is part of is part of this enormous archipelago, whether it is a creation museum or a, a, a museum about Aboriginal Tasmanians in Tas Tasmania. I started noticing that there was this lack of review culture around museums. I started noticing that it was difficult to talk about these concepts that I'm that I'm trying to articulate that the museum director would be too focused on her own museum and that the, the general public doesn't really have the tools to talk about it. And it turns out that, that this is true. I'm, 
scouring all of these things, I try to find museum reviews of museums and newspapers, and it always ends up being in the travel section. It always ends up being in the travel sections with a description of sort of where is a good place to get lunch, what the parking is like, and whether or not you can bring your kids. All important to know if you're visiting it, but not sort of a critique of of a museum or review culture. If you think about other kinds of mediums like movies and television and books, we have those tools in our culture to to talk about them. Even if you're just the most casual consumer of movies, you understand how to read a review of them and and, and the those reviews give a give you the ability to think more critically about them. Uh, book clubs are another perfect perfect example of something that our culture allows for because, again, <laughs> books aren't necessarily trustworthy. It's time to talk about them. And we can talk about them in different ways and it's, it's you know, it's very flexible. Even software is subject to this. You know, even this is, this is a little bit closer to my heart, but it's, it's different philosophies about what kind of user interactions should happen or, or what the relationship between the software and the user should be. That's all, that's all talked about. So I began to think of Museum Archipelago in two ways. On the episode level, it was to be a summary of a museum or a location, which I think should become a museum, like the Buzlishta Monument in Bulgaria. Uh, this is just a ruin, which um, we're hoping to, or we, I would like to see a, I would like to see an interpretive museum of Bulgarian communism in here. Or maybe a review of, with someone who, or an interview with someone um, who, was involved in the museum in some way, either uh, either a, uh, a staff member or a museum director, and sort of talk about the thoughts and feelings and the innovations of that particular museum. But over time, and I realize this is a bit bold to say, I wanted to give my audience the tools to think about museums more critically. And I found that they kind of go well together. It's a little bit of the peanut butter and chocolate. If a museum is authoritative, a podcast is more casual, and if you were going into a museum, why not bring a, friend's, a friend in your ears? And in some ways, the museums and podcasting are moving closer together. We tend to listen to things from people we agree with, and museums are now undergoing the same, the same phenomenon. Uh, museums that advertise themselves as social justice museums or that have uh, a bent of social justice, start to see that reflected in their visitor demographics um, in the same way that what we've seen over the past few decades in every other form of media. It's just that museums have held off a little bit longer. Um, it's to the point where uh, certain museums that do have interpretive exhibits about social justice, this is the Eastern State Penitentiary in, in Philadelphia, which we just, we're just discussing, have kind of a unique advantage because they are, this is the this is the prison where a visitor can go and see Al Capone's cell. There's a draw that isn't part of this, and their advertisement keeps this very quiet. Their sort of exhibits on mass incarceration. However, once you get inside the exhibit, it's pre you're presented with things like this. Um, you can see, have you ever broken the law? Yes, no. If you say no, it gives uh, a plaque that says you are very unusual, which I think is an excellent, an excellent way to do that. Um, so you're not actually separated from the content, but it's a strategy of, of, of questioning the visitor. Like a book club, I'm starting to see the sort of landscape of museum <coughs> podcasts as sort of the book club for museums. And there's a lot of podcasts now that do have this sort of critical thinking about, about museum. Uh, the Whitest Cube by Ariel Lee and Palace Shaw, is, which is also based here in Boston, is excellent. It's just very sharp, witty, entertaining takedown of the world of art museums. The name The Whitest Cube comes from a common art museum display technique called The Whitest Cube, which many of you might be familiar with. Very clever name that works on many levels. Museo Punks by Sue Anderson, Museums in Strange Places by Hannah Hethman, Cultura Conscious by Paula Santos are others in this book club of museums. And I know that some of you have museum, uh, have podcasts that relate to museums that I'm interested to talk about. So slowly and surely, I see the world of museums and podcasts growing. And I see that there is this sort of critical media that can interrogate them. 
if it was that this was the kind of thing that you'd find in the travel section, sort of it wouldn't be as novel, but he, here we are. Um, I see a particularly snug fit between these two mediums. Thank you. I'm uh, Ian Elsner. My podcast is Museum Archipelago, and uh, you can get me up on Twitter. So I wanted to leave 10 minutes for questions. Uh, we have five. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say. Yeah, I, I just am curious about how you feel about museums, like as in MoMA and other types that are, I mean, inviting podcasters, but also museums that are putting out their own podcasts. Mm -hmm. And if that's sort of, that's like a way of bridging that gap of trust that you've spoken on. And that, because the museum has that sense of trust, whether or not to talk about it, think about it, the museum goes into the podcast space, then do we automatically perhaps give that podcast more trust than it necessarily deserves? Or I think that's, a, that's an excellent point. Yeah, I think we do. I think that if you see a podcast that's by the British Museum or by MoMA, you that has a certain authoritative air. I know that Smithsonian's is even called Side Door, which is, uh, which is I, I think, works really well because it sort of invites you in. Um, and through my work as a computer programmer who works in a museum, I have been through those side doors, uh, which makes me sort of less interested in doing the podcast. But I love that idea of bringing people along. And I think also one of the things, though, about a museum doing its own podcast is that we then expect it to sort of have that air, to have a period on what they say instead of a question mark. Um, and I think that's just, that's just, that's just because of that, because of that podcast. What I, what I like about doing my own podcast is that I can say, I'm just coming to this realization and you as my audience are coming there with me. And so it's, it's a little bit, it's something that works well with the intimacy that listeners give you as a podcaster, but we don't expect the same thing from an institution in stone and glass. We actually don't really want it to be finding its way. I, I think, I think that there might be an opportunity for them to say something by doing that. But yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. It does. Um, what is sort of your take, and where do you think these fall in the museum archipelago? Um, mm -hmm. Tourist attractions that use the name museum, such as the Museum of Ice Cream, mm -hmm. which is really just an Instagram <laughs> trap where you sit in a bathtub full of sprinkles and take a picture of yourself. <laughs> that they're not even trying to lay claim to any kind of authority with the term <laughs> museum. Do How do these, I hesitate to even call them institutions, yeah. <laughs> these, uh, these attractions align or um, un possibly undermine the authority yeah. of yeah. traditional media? I wonder how many of them are in the 75,000 museum <laughs> counts. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that they do undermine the um, the word museum, and I think that that is a good thing. I think I, I not that there's pop up. Fit, I mean, I went to one in New York City called the Museum of Color, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was sitting in a bath of sprinkles <laughs> uh, with some cameras around you. Um, I I just think that I think that the word museum can be taken down a few more pegs. And I'm, I'm interested in, in other things that can do it. I think that's kind of a controversial thought in the museum world. I think that a lot of us want to, um, a lot of us really, there, there's, there's all sorts of problems that come from decentralization and, and, and sort of a shared authority because then you know, what is true, but it's not a, it's not a problem unique to museums. So I feel like, Let's just let's just wash our hands clean of, of the word museum as much as possible, even if that isn't about us. <laughs> right? You talk about trust a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of easy to compare trust to kind of a currency. Mm -hmm. And there's two kinds of trust, and they, at least yeah, my, my, my perspective of trust of entertainment, you're not wasting my time, right? Like when you listen to a podcast, you want to be entertained, you don't want to spend an hour like, listening to something you're not going to enjoy. But there's also a trust of like, ethical form of like, I believe what you're saying. Yeah. Where does a museum 
in that spectrum of where I feel like it's going in a certain direction. Yeah. Much like a lot of medium now because, you know, we're all about right now in instant gratification. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a very good point. Yeah. I, I think um, one thing that, that you learn of, of studying the sort of habits of museums is that no matter how long the museum is, uh, visitors get fatigued after an hour and a half. And, and you can start to notice this about um, that, like, oh, all of a sudden, at about an hour and a half into your museum visit, there's all of a sudden a couch and some chairs and some bathrooms. And of course, that's all very deliberate because um, because that's where we expect you to be tired, or that's where museum designers expect you to be tired. I feel that trust um, in my show. Every episode is no longer than 15 minutes. And the reason why that is is because um, I feel like that's about as long as I can I can talk and not say anything dumb. <laughs> so in a half hour show <laughs> like this, um, at least two things. At least two things. <laughs> Anyone? I thought it was really interesting what you said about like the museum that has a stage of social justice to yeah. like, in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you feel that disruption is happening in so I'm not in the museum at all. But like is it present in like these really large institutions and like reframing of the way that we view artifacts? I think about it because I, I don't know if you've ever read The Power by Naomi Alderman. You should read it. It's yeah. Obama's best book in 2017 and it's incredible. It's basically about this world in which the power roles are flipped because it's not really important to this question, but women like gain power to just, just, just shoot electricity just in their hands and kill people. Uh -huh. And so, but part of it is that it's told from like features futuristic perspective and they have like artifacts being rolled throughout the book and there was one where it was like a bust of a woman and like a bust of a man and um it was like well clearly this is a queen and her servant boy uh -huh. and the afterward Naomi Alderman is like in every museum I've ever been to these are like artifacts and it's never questioned that it's a king and his servant woman and that was the first time I'd ever really thought of like reframing ancient history because I, I I don't know I just I don't know, I haven't had that lens. So I'm wondering if you feel like that kind of reframing or just like <coughs> the cradle board and is happening in these like really large institutions where like these artifacts just like get put on display and they're maybe not questioned. Yeah, I think that, I think you're right. I think that one of the issues is that you can only expect a refresh every 20 years or so mm -hmm. uh, in, in sort of the bigger institutions on sort of their, what they have on display. And of course it's very expensive, which, which opens the door up to a whole bunch of other um, uh, a whole bunch of other ethical suits. But I do think that some that some large institutions are thinking about this about this more. And um, there are different ways of engaging the audience's trust. Um, some museums, and I've, I've seen this done, some museums don't print the label and instead invite the visitor to print the label for them. Um, it turns out that this works best if you if you, if the visitor is uh, convinced that their that their um, label is, would actually be useful to the museum, otherwise instead of just being an exercise and, and sort of letting the kids play with crayons or something like that, and that's sort of an example of that seating control that I think works well. Again, for a larger institution, I don't know how, I don't know where that leads us, but sense. I. I Again, it's. I think it's most easy to see this in history in museums. I think it's it's harder to see this. You might notice that Museum Art Republic does not talk about art museums hardly at all. Um, it's just because I don't I don't really have the tools to talk about art. Science museums are fun for me because I can I can move into a little bit of a different realm that I'm I'm more comfortable with because how kids learn science is is uh, how I was trained. Um, <laughs> But it's it's sort of the it's sort of that and how that relates to the to the history of museums that this lives in. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Um. I mean, museums for a lot of people are the first step. That, like we heard earlier today in the keynote, curiosity is the first step towards more education. The harm that museums do, to what extent is it, in your opinion, they're a 
toxic uh, mm -hmm. descriptions and, and uh, the depictions that some museums are making. I mean, I don't want to get into checks and balances or yeah, like yeah. a scale kind of thing, but like, is how much of that could be forgiven for getting people interested to find out more mm -hmm. and like perhaps learn the actual truth? Of yeah. It? In, in your, I know it's a difficult. Question. No, no, that, that that that's fascinating, and I think I think it's I think it's one of these things that um, the the iner the way I think about it is that the inertia of news and news is so strong um, that this cultural force has been rolling down the hill for so long mm -hmm. that it's going to be fine. Like it's it. There's not a world where in 20 years there are no more museums. I, I just don't see that world as as realistically possible. Um, I do see a world, and, and so that's why I don't I don't get into sort of the checks and balances for an individual museum. You know, I'm very happy to say, for example, um, to go back to to Buzlishta, uh, you know, the Bulgaria does not have a museum of communism, a museum that ter interprets its communist past. It actually has some museums, but a, a children's museum is a new concept. The children's museum opened up in Sofia in 2005. Um, you can find this in episode 46 of Museum Archipelago. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the director of the museum, when I interviewed her, said that, you know, um, we have a really hard time because people, parents come in and they think it's going to be a, an exhibit about children and not an exhibit that you can take your kids to. Mm -hmm. um, Bulgaria needs one of these museums. It's good for Bulgaria to have a way to interpret its communist past because right now um, it's just it's just being forgotten um, after thirty years after the collapse. So, so yeah, I, I I feel like, but I do feel like that process is again rolling down the hill to make it happen. And the the more important thing to me is that given that the ball is going to roll down the hill, what can we? How can we move it slightly? Uh, I would like to know if you have like, done something about these uh, materials that um, think think about the ubiquity instead of the inside museum. If you have done this you say that again about the about the yeah, material. Yeah, you have done something about these materials or these ubiquity materials mm -hmm. instead of inside museum. You mean like out in a yes. pop up space uh -huh, or yes, something uh -huh. like that? Yeah. You take teams to all the place, you know, like yeah. extra walls. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think that's that's super interesting. Um, one of my exhibit, sorry. See, you can see how I'm constantly switching to these. One of my podcasts is about um, museums in or museum-like spaces in metro systems. Um, Sofia, Bulgaria is actually a place where there's a there's a, a lot of exhibits within the metro station, and of course, it's way more viewed. The artifacts on display there than in any museum because people are using public transit on their daily commutes, um, and yes, I think I think that there's I think that that's a really interesting sort of move to the future of, of of museums. In other words, to take it out of those buildings of stone and glass and columns and put it put it more on the street, and we see a lot of ways of there. I, I think there are many ways of doing it, but I think that just that it's that it's usually it's usually good because it's just more foot traffic and it allows you to find yourself in a museum experience instead of having the premeditated thoughts about it. I think that so much of the visitor experience is the is um, we call it in the museum world rehearsing. You know, you rehearse for the visit and then you you talk about it after. And you talk about what you know. You talk about what you're going to see, and with your group, you're excited and not. And that is good, um, but it also it also means that you're approaching in a certain mindset. If you just discover it, if you just walk into it, and you're surrounded by gallery walls, that's something kind of special because you haven't rehearsed, and um, that's usually a, usually a more honest um, usually a more honest reaction. Well, thanks everyone. This was great. Um,